class? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? Everybody's having a good day? Anybody not having a good day? Nobody's going to tell me if they're not having a good day, right? Okay. Um, let's see. First of all, uh, two things. Uh, one, the video for yesterday hasn't been posted yet. Sometimes it takes longer to render the video. That's out of my hands. Um, so it will always be up in 48 hours, but it won't always be up in 24. So if you've been looking for it today, it's not there. And um, what has to happen with the videos is I take the videos, I have to uh, do what's called a rendering with them. There's a software thing where the software has to sort of crunch it, et cetera, et cetera. And then after I've done that, I give it to OSU. OSU has a, a, an online product that also has to do some crunching on it before they'll provide it. And I, that's the part I can't control. I can control my part. I can't control their part. Um, so the stuff is sitting with them. And when there's variability, it's sometimes me, but it's usually them in terms of how fast their, their um, system is operating. So we're waiting on them right now. I did post highlights of yesterday earlier this afternoon, so you'd have those. And uh, as soon as the OSU thing is set, probably later this evening, I'll have it uh, up and posted for you. And then hopefully we'll have tomorrow, or today is posted for you, obviously sometime tomorrow. Okay? That's one thing. Uh, second thing, several of you have asked me about books, and um, I apologize. I meant to mention this in class yesterday. First of all, I think the books are absolutely, the book in this class is absolutely outrageously expensive. Um, I think publishers are making off like bandits, and I'll say that very publicly. Okay? Uh, the question is, do you have to have a book or not have to have a book? And the, I, I wish I could give you a straight answer to that. I provide you with a lot of materials. I provide you with figures that all are from the book. I provide you with my highlights. I provide you with notes and things like that, obviously the videos. And since the most important things are what I talk about, hopefully you, need, you, you get that. Some people like a book, and that's great. I, I never, as I said, go back and pull something obscure out of the book that I didn't talk about. Okay, on an exam. I'd never do that. I would never do that. So the book is there for you to supplement your knowledge, learn something in a way that perhaps I hadn't taught it to you. Um, I don't have any extra books to put in the library. But what I will do is I have one or maybe two old versions of the textbook. I took it over the I started taking it over the library and I ran out of time that I will take over and put on reserve that you can check out uh, from there. And you're welcome to those. If anytime you want to come and ask me questions, or you want to look in my book, because I do have a current version of the book, you're welcome to do that. Okay? Uh, but I think 200 bucks, whatever it is for that, that book, is outrageous, uh, personally. So, um, yes? Uh, the problem with old versions is sometimes the numbering changes, so I, I can't tell you that. But if, again, if you have questions, you want to come by and ask me to point them out to you, I'd be happy to do it if you have an older version of the textbook and you want me to do that. Okay? So don't let the price of the textbook be a limitation for you. I, do, I, I really don't like that. And, I, and I'm a textbook author. And as I told somebody yesterday, the reason textbook prices are high is not because of royalties they're paying to authors. OK? It's absolutely true. So um, you don't get rich writing a textbook. That's, that's also true. But it's important to write a textbook. Someday I want to write an open source textbook where I put it online. It's free. And everybody's got access to it. I think that would make the most sense in the world to do. The publishers would not be very happy with me if I did that. But I will do that sometime. OK, uh, so I got you started, hopefully not too scared yesterday, talking about water, talking about solutions, and getting started talking uh, about buffers. And I'm going to spend a lot of time today talking about buffers. And I recognize that this is a subject that, for a lot of you, is one you're not real comfortable with. And the reason that you're not real comfortable with it is either A, general chemistry probably didn't prepare you real well, which happens a lot, and B, you're not real confident of your math. And um, I will tell you that there's not a lot of math that we do in this class, and the main math that you see in the class is up front. So what you see now isn't something you're going to see next week, the week after, et cetera, but it is a component of what you need to, to understand. Okay. But the whole course is not about math. So I'll tell you that before I start and get going on math. If you have problems with understanding the material, feel free. As I said, come by my office. I'll be more than happy to work problems with you, show you how to do things. Um, I'm probably going to post some solutions um, online that you can look at. I've had a couple requests for that, for the practice problems that I put out there. And I will post some solutions for that. And if you those things don't help and you want a tutor or something like that, again, I can help you to find a tutor. So uh, don't let your own. Um, uh, you know, anxieties about this get in the way of, of uh, your success in the class. Okay? 
Uh, and don't be a stranger, don't be bashful. I won't bite you. If I do, I've had my shots, so it's okay. Okay, well, um, last time I talked about water, and I said, you know, we're, we're, we're walking balls of water, and depending upon our sex and our, our age and our level of obesity, our content of water changes, but within our cells, we can, it's a safe bet to say that we got a lot of water, a lot of water there, and that water is necessary because it dissolves so many things that are in, of importance to us. And so what happens to water affects everything else that's dissolved in it. That's why we spend some time at the beginning talking about water, because there's a lot of things that affect water. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. So if I am uh, doing my morning jog, I love to jog, okay? So I'm out jogging, and by the way, I'm a very slow jogger, so, you know. Uh, I'm a very slow jogger. I get out there, I go jogging in the morning. I work up a big sweat, probably doing things that you guys would roll out of bed doing, all right? I work up a big sweat. When I'm working hard with my jogging, what's happening is my cells are producing protons. We'll talk later about why that's the case, but suffice it to say that when I am jogging, my muscle cells are producing a lot of protons. Well, what do protons do? You know from what I've said before that protons, of course, change the pH of um, the water that they happen to be in. And if that water happens to be my bloodstream, then I'm, if I don't do something about that, then the pH of my bloodstream is going to change and change drastically because I can put out a lot of protons when I'm running fairly hard, okay? Well, fortunately, as I said, we have buffers that are dissolved in our uh, cells, dissolved in our bloodstream, dissolved in a lot of different things that help resist those changes in pH, that is the change in uh, proton concentration, because they can absorb them. Okay, So a buffer is something that resists change in proton concentration. So if my muscle cells are out there making a lot of protons, if something is gobbling them up and holding on to them, then the actual concentration of protons that are in my bloodstream doesn't change very much. And you might say, well, why do you care? The reason I care is if I change the proton concentrations of my cells, or my blood or whatever component I want to talk about. If I change the concentration of those protons significantly, I will change the charge of the proteins that I have. I will change the, the charge of the DNA that I have. And I will make them non-functional. I will kill myself. So those buffers that are there, those protective things that are there that are absorbing those protons are helping me to keep from killing myself with my jog, even though I might feel like I'm dying as I'm running. Okay? Make sense? All right. So it's important for us to understand then how a buffer works, how protons affect a buffer, how a buffer affects protons, because what we're going to see is after we talk about that, we're going to then begin to understand how our, the charges in our proteins get changed. That's a very, very important consideration because Proteins are what I describe as the workhorses of, li of living cells, and they're not the kinds of things we want to muck with. Okay? Everybody on the same page with me? Okay. Well, um, let's go to where I finished the lecture yesterday. Last yesterday, I finished the lecture by introducing the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. Now, I know that the minute I put this thing on the screen, all of a sudden I can almost hear a collective, <gasps> right? Because there's a bunch of gobbledygook up there, an awful lot of gobbledygook. And I think a lot of classes that you take, and this is true whether you're taking a class that's a major in biochemistry or you're taking it like you guys are non-majors in biochemistry, there's way too much emphasis on deriving this sort of information and not enough emphasis on giving you what's the bottom line? What does this stuff mean? So what I try to do with you is give you the bottom line of what it means and then teach you how to use that. That's what we want to focus on. So I don't really care about how we got that equation. I'm sure you don't care about how we got that equation. It's not the most important thing. The most important thing is this equation right here. And like I said yesterday, you will not have to memorize an equation for my exam. I will give you every single equation that you need. But you should know how to use those equations. And that's where the problems come in, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. 
Well, the equation that you see at the bottom of this guy right here is called the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. Okay? And I won't spell it out for you. It's spelled out on the, on the uh, thing. Henderson-Hasselbach equation. This equation on surface looks like, well, it's just another equation, another thing we've got to know, another thing we've got to do. Why do we have this equation? Why do we care about this equation? The reason that we care about this equation is because it tells us a relationship. It tells us a very important relationship. Okay? The relationship that it tells us is that the pH, and remember that pH is a measure of proton concentration, the pH of a solution varies as our amount of salt and acid vary. Okay? It varies as the amount of salt and acid that we have varies. If I change the amount of salt and change the amount of acid, then I will change the pH of a solution that contains them. So there are three things here that can change. pH can change. Salt can change. Remember, salt is the guy without the proton. Weak acid can change. That's the guy with the proton. Those three, thing can sh three, yeah, three things can change. That means, well, if there's three that can change, there must be one that can't. One is a constant for a given acid. So if I'm talking about acetic acid, which is what I was talking about yesterday, which is what I'll be talking about most of today, if I'm talking about acetic acid, that pKa that's there is a constant for acetic acid. It's 4.76. And no, you don't need to know that. I'll give you that on an exam as well. You don't need to memorize any numbers. But as long as I'm talking about a solution of acetic acid, I'm always talking about the same pKa. That's a constant. That's never going to change for acetic acid. I want you to remember that. Because about a third of you on the exam are going to answer a problem where you're going to try to tell me it changes. Okay? So pKa is going to be a constant for a given S. What's pKa? Why do we care about pKa? Well, remember we're talking about weak acids. We're talking about weak acids, okay? The difference between a weak acid and a strong acid was that a strong acid completely comes apart. Every single molecule I put into water splits. When I talk about, uh, uh, that's a strong acid. When I talk about a, uh, a strong acid, they all come apart. A weak acid, by contrast, they don't all come apart. And what this tells me is that as the pH changes, the amount that's come apart is going to change too. So I gave you an example yesterday. I said acetic acid, we got 1 in 50 million. 1 in 50 million come apart. Okay? Pretty small percentage. Well, why do we care about that? Well, if I, don't, if I put it into pure water and I don't do anything else, I get 1 in 50 million. But what if I put it into pure water and I change the pH? This tells me that the amount of salt and acid will change. So it's no longer 1 in 50 million. It's some number that is uh, something we can calculate. And I'll show you that. All right? So what, I came back to my original question. What's pKa? pKa is a measure of the strength of a weak acid. I'll give you a very simple rule. If you wanted to go derive this equation, you could figure it out yourself, but you probably don't want to derive the equation, and I don't want, I don't want you to. The simple rule is that the lower the pKa is, the stronger the weak acid is. Now we're talking about strong weak acids. If I have acetic acid, it has a pKa of 4.76. If I have formic acid, it has a pKa of 3.75. And don't ask me why those numbers stay in my head, but they do. Formic acid, because it has a lower pKa, is a stronger weak acid than is acetic acid. All right? Make sense? So pKa is a measure of the strength of a weak acid. So when I say strength of an acid, what does that tell you? Strength of a weak acid. A strong weak acid. How does it differ from a weak weak acid? Not, don't just tell me the pKa is different. Is it the percentage that dissociates? That's correct. So a strong acid compared to a weak acid at the same pH will have more protons off, right? The difference between a strong acid in general and a weak acid was that the strong acid had everything off and the weak acid.